and our next speaker um, is really the, the sort of go-to guy when it comes to, to PPE. Of course, you know, mass and things like that are important, but in the in the cold chain, we uh, we have a much greater requirement for a sort of PPE. And uh, and Tarek comes from a really remarkable kind of background as, as on one hand uh, an A&E nurse, and on the other hand, um, as I said, managing director of Goldfree. So I know Tarek, you've got some fascinating insight on the virus, and also uh, some tips on, on you know how we can um, kind of how we can manage that within our facilities. So uh, over to you, Tarek. Just going to and David control. Good morning, good morning, Tom. Good morning, everybody. I just want to make sure you can see this. Uh, just if I hit the slideshow and share my screen, uh, uh, can you see that? Are we are we good? Again, if you just um, pop it into slideshow mode. Okay, just uh, two seconds. Slideshow uh, from open start. Yep. Oh, can you hear? Can you see? There we go. Okay, that's Perfect. great. Over to you. Thanks, Terry. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning, everybody. Um, and thanks for that introduction, Tom. Hello, I'm, I'm Tarek Hyatt. I'm the managing director of, of, of Goldfreeze. Uh, we're one of the UK's leading um, manufacturers and suppliers of uh, specialist PPE into cold stores, freezers um, and chillers. Our main customer group uh, generally tends to be cold chain environments. So it's three PL providers, um, major multiple supermarkets, um, food manufacturing and also into the public sector. Um, as Tom's also mentioned, I'm an a &E nurse specialist and uh, so that my sort of alter ego at weekends, I've been uh, working uh, in that field. Uh, so I've been working in the NHS um, pretty much every weekend in the whole of 2020, um, trying to help out on the front line. Uh, so I've got quite close, up close and personal with, with, with COVID. Um, so last year I was working at Hull Royal Infirmary uh, and this year I've been assigned to Lincoln, my, Lincoln Hospital, my local hospital. So I've got quite an interesting understanding of, of, of COVID. Um, so really what I wanted to do this morning is a very brief overview of PPE, but also from a slightly, with a slightly health bias to it in terms of really trying to get under the skin of what's going on with COVID and the particular challenges to the, the cold chain, because I believe we are probably at a slightly higher risk than the, the general population, and I'll explain why as we go through. So the key areas of exploration really are, uh, what is the hazard uh, that we're looking to try and, uh, and, and deal with? Um, how can we develop uh, and adapt procedures and, and guidance? Um, monitoring and intervention and looking at some PPE solutions, um, and also particularly thinking about what the PPE solutions of the future are gonna be, and what we're already beginning to think of uh, as we really try and take on what's probably been the biggest challenge probably humanity's faced for, for some time. So really what I wanted to go through is the chain, what we call the chain of infection. So in, in healthcare, we look at the chain of infection in terms of how an infection actually works. So if we start at the top, you'll see um, we have the infectious agent. In this case, it's COVID, so it's, it could be bacteria, it could be a virus or fungus or whatever. And then you need a source of that infection. So it needs to infect a host. And in the case of a virus, a virus always needs a host uh, to, to, to multiply and, and to thrive. Um, in that regard, uh, it generally, in this case, it's been us as, as human beings. And at that point, we then have, we have to, it has to find a way of transmitting itself to, to, to perpetuate itself. So it, le it goes from the reservoir or the people, us, for example, um, and then it finds a mechanism of being able to transmit itself to another person. So in, in the case of COVID, quite often it's coughing, sneezing. Um, uh, generally, those are two of the big ways of it moving around, also through, through touch and contamination. And then at that point, once it's airborne through the mode of transmission, um, it then gets into another person. Um, so we're looking at things like uh, being breathed in, for example and then the new the person receives it, they're not immune as we've, as we've found because nobody's had the immunity to this previously um, and therefore then the whole chain begins again. So really what we're trying to focus on today is very much around looking at this area here where we can stop the cycle between the portal of exit and the mode of transmission. And that's been the focus of the government's um, policy of trying to tackle this disease. Everything very much around uh, arresting transmission. Uh, and that is no different in, in, in uh, what we're trying to do with PPE and how we're managing um, ourselves and our colleagues in the workplace. So if you then move on, I wanted to show you a little bit more about what's going on under the surface of COVID. And from, again, from a health perspective, 
the, the, the aspect I'm coming at is very much from um, a respiratory perspective, because if you actually think about colleagues working in a, in a, in a freezer or a cold store, they're very much protected by gloves, ha um, accessories, hats, um, um, clothing, boots, etc. So in terms of actual skin contact or contact with other, with other human beings, it's actually not that great as it would be perhaps um, in an office where you've got people touching things all the time with bare hands. Um, but so in, we're going to focus very much on the respiratory effect of this because that's the area I believe that the that COVID has the greatest chance of transmission in the cold environment. I'll go on to that a little bit closer, in a bit more detail shortly. But we need to start from what happens when it gets into the lungs. Now, we are looking at extreme infection. So just a, sort of a, a bit of a health warning on this, if you'll pardon the pun, because really don't, not everybody goes through this to this extreme that I'm going to show you. But if, I, if you see what a chest X-ray looks like in health, that, this will give us a good baseline to work from. So an average healthy person, this is a, a, a man, basically you can see he's got a nice clearly defined heart here. It's all nice and, and it, it takes up quite a big space here in the chest. You can see some nice, lots of black here, which is great, which means lots of nice clear intercostal space. It means the lungs are nice and clear. Um, and then you can see the diaphragm here. It's all nicely, very, very clearly defined. So this person can take nice deep breaths and then breathe out again without any problems at all. We then move on to what we would look at as a community acquired um, pneumonia. Uh, this is an elderly person. Um, and what you find with, with these is that you can see immediately that the intercostal spaces are a little bit more opaque because this person's obviously with age and with repeated chest infections, they've got some scarring tissue in the lungs. But what's the interesting thing about the pneumonia and what makes this a slam dunk pneumonia on chest X-ray is that you can see here that there's a big consolidation in the red circle here. So that means that there's a lot of infection going on. The pneumococcal uh, bacterial infection uh, are just swimming around there, causing lots of inflammation. Um, and if you can also see that, um, the, but uh, that, that, that's actually causing that, this person to be very ill, very unwell, they'll need a lot of oxygen, they require intravenous antibiotics, but this is a bacterial infection. Um, you can, this is a single pneumonia, double pneumonia, you've probably heard the expression double, is if you had a consolidation on the other side as well. So, and that's where a person can become very, very ill. You'll also know it's actually just a matter of interest. This person's heart is, is quite big. There's a lot of heart failure going on here. So again, this person is un, un, in normal health. This person is struggling to breathe in the first place. So because their the heart is congested and they're not getting the oxygen and uh, blood flow around the body that um, they would normally get in health, which actually also gives you an indication of why older people, particularly with chest and respiratory problems, tend to be very, very um, vulnerable and don't do very well once they get COVID. Uh, but what's also interesting to note here is that you'll see you've got um, you've got a reasonable amount of lung capacity here. So this patient has got lung capacity to work with that we as clinicians can work with in terms of bringing them back to health. So that's quite an interesting scenario. Pneumonias typically look like this, and, and these are very, very straightforward and very easy. Um, uh, uh, x-rays to, to diagnose and to treat. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. This is COVID. This is a young male patient, as you can see, and the first thing you notice is look at his lungs there. The, the, the inflammation is profuse. It's everywhere. So this is an erect chest on, to the, on the left. It's an erect chest x-ray. So this, this person sitting there, hopefully he's been able to sit there long enough without coughing so they can get a chest x-ray out of him. As you can see, the inflammation is everywhere. We don't have any clear intercostal spaces. It's all opaque, it's all gray. And if you look on the, on the, on the lateral position on the right-hand side, you can see it's quite a very uh, poor position that this patient's in. Literally, it's almost like his lungs, lungs are filled with cotton wool or concrete. Uh, and this is somebody who would have been otherwise healthy. And you can tell this because of the size of the heart. You can see the diaphragm is still clearly defined at the bottom, but you can see the heart there. This is a fairly young person. And within a very short period of time, this person's deteriorated. So if you look at what's happened, you've got profuse lung, lung inflammation, you've got significant reduction in lung capacity, high respiratory effort. This person will be running a marathon literally all day, every day to just to breathe. Uh, they'll be having high oxygen demand, typically 15 liters. This is which is the highest oxygen we can give a human being. Um, they can, they'll have reduced organ oxygenation. And if this person survives, then effectively they will end up with fibrosed uh, lung tissue, potentially. Um, 
so long term that they will have lung problems in the future. Uh, they could end up with a multi-organ damage, although this person's heart is quite healthy now, overexertion long term could create heart failure and that would add to this person's problems even more. And we're still trying to grapple with it with what's going on with long COVID. So there's a whole raft of stuff going on here. Um, and this makes this disease particularly nasty because there are no rules with this. And what's interesting is that a young person in an environment could end up in ITU with this kind of chest X-ray profile. Somebody else, a co-worker, a loved one could end up contracting the, the, the disease, but actually not end up having this problem and end up being asymptomatic. And that's what makes COVID so particularly difficult to deal with. Um, and particularly dangerous and nasty. So in terms of looking at the procedures then, um, just really following on from what our colleague just talked about, um, very much hand in glove, and, uh, which is quite, quite interesting, they're all saying similar things, which is good. The hands face space uh, a principle still applies, and you can read through this quite clearly. I mean, additional cleaning procedures my colleague just mentioned in his previous presentation, um, deep cleans for people when, they, when they've got them, uh, temperature checking, hand washing, hand sanitizing, and face coverings. These are great and they work really well um, in society and in general business, in offices and in other, in other areas where people are working. But we have some really unique challenges in the cold chain, which I'll now go on to. Um, so Colin Furness at the University of Toronto did a little bit of initial research on COVID and the evidence base uh, is growing, uh, that COVID thrives in the cold. And Furness came up with four main reasons why this is the case. Firstly, that the virus hangs in dry air longer. So you can imagine, um, just in very simple terms, when you, when you, on a cold day, you breathe out, you can see your breath. Those droplets take longer to disperse, they hang in the air longer. And so basically maybe somebody walking past as, as you're breathing out might actually be, um, uh, in breathing in some of those some droplets if, if a person is, is infected. Cold air helps the virus remain active and able to infect others and if you actually think this through the whole idea of cold chain is to keep products fresh, to keep food fresh, to, to prolong the life of, um, of organic material and viruses are no different. So in a way the virus is using the cold against us which is which is uh, makes it even more uh, dangerous. Cold air reduces our system, systemic ability to resist, path, resist pathogens. Um, as, as, our body, as our bodies are colder and we, we're living in a colder environment, so we are slightly more immunocompromised. And the proximity transmission is higher in an enclosed cold area. Now, it's interesting that there have been a number of break, outbreaks in um, places like abattoirs and food processing plants, where proximity is an issue insofar as you have people working perhaps closer when they're, you know, they're cutting animal carcasses or on a line making quiches or whatever they're doing. Um, also interesting, these are noisy environments where people tend to shout at each other quite a bit. Um, so again, you've got more droplet infection in a relatively cold environment, although it's only minus five to plus five. So in that regard, it's, it's not as cold as a 20 minus 24 minus 28 cold chain environment, but it's very, it's still a cold environment and, and um, COVID really enjoys and, and thrives in those environments. So this is the kind of baseline that we're working from in terms of our unique challenge in the cold chain. And of course, then when we look to try and resolve this through PPE, there's a, there's a further problem insofar as, for example, face coverings are problematic because we, they tend to have a moisture buildup. So regardless of the face covering, you've still got to breathe. breathe breathing is, is warm, the air is cold, you, the two meet each other and condensation happens. The same with face shields, which are impractical due to condensation. Hand washing and sanitization isn't possible in gloved hands. And the argument could be, and a fair, fairly uh, convincing one is, your hands gloved, you're not touching anything. But at the end of the day, um, people do remove hands, and do take off gloves or uh, to use their hands to, to do uh, uh, use equipment or a pen or whatever it is. So there is still that possibility. And we don't have potentially the option to have as much uh, chance to sanitize our hands as you would do perhaps in an office or in another environment or healthcare environment. Um, the other thing is, in, in terms of our products, we, we everything that we're about is about uh, breathability in terms of making sure that the the, uh, the colleagues colleague stays warm, but doesn't. And as they sweat, the the, the their moisture and the, the sweat from their, their work is uh, is taken to the surface of the product, 
so it leaves it leaves them through the, uh, the the fabrics that we use. So the whole idea is about moisture vapor permeability, um, getting a moisture away from the from the from the wearer out to the surface. But of course, that builds up moisture on the surface. So everything we're trying to do to keep the person warm and it works isn't helping in terms of COVID because as the as the the air as the uh, garment is moist, it freezes on the outside slightly, and there's great environment for uh, for COVID to grow. I mentioned about close proximity uh, in food processing um, and the longer dissipation time, as I've mentioned. One thing also in cold stores, in some cold stores I've come across, there is a tradition of sharing PPE. So for example, there'll be jackets lying around for people to, to go into the cold store and use uh, for visitors or temporary, or sometimes there are some products around where people can share boots using different liners. Again, that's a, poss that's a possible route of infection. So that needs to be potentially looked at going forward. Ventilation, although you have got doors um, coming in and out of the, the cold store, one of the things I think that perhaps um, needs to be looked at is ventilation, although that almost in a, in a way defeats the object of, of maintaining things cold. I'm sure Rob Lamb will be able to tell you more about refrigeration. Um, but in reality, from our point of view, ventilation, although there is some, can be a challenge. Um, and that so that the air remains the same within the cold store. So in terms of PPE risk reduction, we can look at things like, for example, particularly risk respiratory transmission. And that's our main area of focus. We believe that that's kind of being going to be the area that people are going to have to look at um, going forward. The question is, how do we do it? We're looking at things like face coverings, but how do you wear a face covering as moisture builds up and freezing becomes problematic? Now, one of our products is a, is a snood, like a neck warmer, which a lot of I've noticed a lot of colleagues are wearing over their, their mouth and nose. There are also balaclavas available that you can you can use where you've got a, a small face and the mouth is covered. Um, they work to a certain degree, but um, if we're looking at things like uh, uh, making sure that we don't get any transmission, it's important that they're wearing the face covering all the time. That creates its own problems. Distance is absolutely essential, as our, our colleague mentioned in his previous um, uh, presentation. Um, also, I know some of our some of our um, customers are using early uh, detection of body temperature, so there are um, uh, thermal equipment as people walk in the door, so they, they get the temperature measured. Um, I think also making our colleagues aware in the, in the cold store of of the fact that there's atmospheric droplets from talking, breathing, etc. Um, so again, space is absolutely essential. Going forward, we, we and our, 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 we certainly as a business, but I know people in our in the PPE industry are looking at antiviral fabrics and treatments. For example, there's a German company called Viraloft, Vira which is an antiviral uh, fabric that's used for face coverings. But again, we're still trying to overcome the issue of condensation and freezing uh, as with with breath meet, warm breath meeting cold air. We could look at we do need to look at cold store respiratory solutions. Forced air, for example, forced air ventilation, which is something that's used, for example, by uh, local ambulance services when they're going to um, call to see COVID patients, is a solution in in a nor in in outside of the cold store, but isn't in the cold store. As battery failure is a big issue, and I'm sure anybody who's got a, a battery operated um, uh, forklift truck will, will testify to that. Um, we've reached out to people like the British Antarctic Survey and to look into their breathing solutions um, and see what we can learn from that. But we are still a fair way behind, I have to say, in terms of what we can able what we can do right now. And we are fighting against a, an enemy that really is kind of using the laws of physics against us um, in terms of the vapor, liquid, um, and ice uh, chain, if you like. Um, and therefore, we need to find more creative solutions and find something that's actually going to work. Um, it is almost incredibly counterintuitive to when, when, you, when you think that actually bacteria die in the cold and a virus actually does even better. It's, it's quite, quite a thing to get your head around. We could look at, so in terms of PPE risk reduction, we've got some ideas in terms of how we can work with that. In terms of moisture management, for example, um, this, this picture to the right is a drying cabinet, one of our products that we sell. Um, basically where devices can be put inside them to uh, such as ionization devices. I, I'm, I'm aware of some new devices uh, using ozone or cold plasma, UV light is another option um, and washing and drying, dry cleaning of products is another way of doing it but that's not practical between shifts. So something like for example a drying cabinet where it, the, the air is, is warm 
the, the products are dried uh, carefully and, and, and correctly, um, and you use something like a deionizer or ozone to, to, to disinfect and, and remove odors, etc., can actually work really well. Um, I think the other thing to consider also is disinfection of areas where colleagues remain in their PPE, for example, in rest areas such as where they go out for a cigarette or whatever they do. Um, and really, I would recommend that colleagues, once they're out of the cold sore, really should be changing into their normal clothes and then going back into the hands face face chain to work with when they're when they're going around other part, other departments on site. Um, the amount of people I've seen in cold store clothing in their canteens um, pre COVID. Uh, was probably you know majority, uh, and I think that needs to probably change culturally. Um, we can also look at things like reducing touch transmission, um, PPE not to be shared, as I mentioned earlier, and storage in these lockers, high hygiene outside the cold store and infection, and really developing a, an infection control culture within the organisation. Kind of just not just thinking health and safety, but actual infection control. Um, and, but the, the good news is, I mean, from what I've from speaking to several colleagues and the odd time I visited. Um, there has been a high degree of success in, in COVID risk management. So it's not all bad news in terms of COVID having, you know, the head start on us. Uh, and I think colleagues are doing extremely well. I'm sure they'll be able to give us an update uh, from the ISCO uh, in terms of what their experiences have been. Um, so in terms of future development, um, I mentioned earlier antiviral fabrics and materials. Um, really, we want to look at respiratory solutions um, and actually the best PPE that anybody can have at this moment in time um, is to try and get vaccine, vaccinated as soon as possible. As soon as we've got vaccines out there, it's not a panacea, but it will reduce risk significantly. I mentioned PPE storage and management. Ventilation is an issue I'm sure that uh, will come up for uh, for discussion within within the uh, uh, within the cold chain uh, community. Um, also looking at colleague risk assessments for COVID. I showed you the x-rays earlier. Do, they, do colleagues have underlying conditions? Should somebody with, with a heart condition or heart failure be working in, in a cold store? I don't know. These are, these are questions that you'll have to consider in your own environments and with your own occupational health team. Uh, but it's, it really, and somebody potentially with COPD, the risk for areas are COPD, um, renal failure, heart failure. You've also got a slightly higher risk with members of BAME communities, as yet unknown why. Um, but the uh, mortality rate and severe illness rate amongst BAME community members are much higher. This is still as yet un un not understood, and that may be something to consider as part of your risk assessment. Um, and perhaps also looking at your business processes and thinking how can we adjust what we're doing to ma manage risk um, in terms of our business processes, other ways in which we can get people to self -isolate, to, to isolate from each other and work at a better distance using technology, for example, or using automation. And also the use of disinfectation technology such as UV light um, on entry to exit and exiting cold store environments um, and not really in our remit but something that potentially could could work. UV lights had some success. Um, we believe in the future that smarter clothing will probably be a part, a way, part of the solution in the longer term i.e for example taking temperatures of, of, uh, of client of, of, of customers and, uh, and, and colleagues um, using sensors. Um, and really, we need we think probably need a bit more joined up uh, thinking in terms of how we are going to do this, and a combination of, of tech and textile. Um, oops, sorry, sorry. So, in summary, um, as I mentioned earlier, COVID really has no rules, and uh, that's the scary part of COVID. It just doesn't have any rules. Somebody could have it and be completely asymptomatic. Somebody else could have it and end up in ITU. And that's what makes it particularly difficult to deal with. It really does thrive in cold environments. Um, and it, this is something we really need to get a hold of in the cold chain because um, it really does love the cold. And so I think it puts us in a unique situation whereby we have a, probably a higher risk than most other places. So for cold temperature PPE, COVID uses the laws of physics against us, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and that makes it even more difficult. This is a pretty formidable enemy that we're up against. It is a unique challenge. And Coltain colleagues really are managing remarkably well, as far as I can see, considering how much is stacked against them. Um, and we think that we will require more technical and solution focused approaches in our, how, we, uh, how we bring PPE to market. That will make it more expensive, it will make it, but it will make it more research based. 
um, and it can save lives in the future. But I think in the meantime, or certainly in the medium term, more research needs to be done on the effects of COVID on cold store colleagues, I think from a health perspective, but also uh, in terms of transmission as well, because I think that could be uh, a good starting point for us and for the industry in terms of how we move forward with our response in terms of PPE, in terms of new systems, new business processes. Um, so it's, it's a formidable challenge, but an interesting challenge. And one I think as, a, as an industry, if we all come together, I think we can, we can solve. 